Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the um, uh, last day, uh, the first session of the last day. Uh, well, actually, it was worth waiting another five minutes because we managed to double our audience, uh, apparently. So, <laughs> so um, I would suggest to, to start immediately. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. It's last day, Friday, nine o'clock after dinner. No worries. I'm going to try to be uh, not very boring for you. And my name is Begoña Vila. I'm from the Institute of Technology to Control the Marine Environment in Galicia. And I would like to talk to you how to tell you how are we trying to improve the management of Galicia, accidental marine pollution response in Galicia. So, the first question, family. Do you know where Galicia is, someone? Yeah, more or less. Uh, okay, just for those of you who don't know where Galicia is, Galicia is in the northwest of Spain. Um, as you can see, we, Galicia is bordered by the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean uh, to the west, the Cantabrian Sea to the north, and limited uh, uh, to the south with, uh, by Portugal. So, <coughs> with over 1,500 kilometers of coastline, it's easy to deduce that for us the fishing industry is very, very important and the coastal resources are a very important part of this. Um, add to this that um, uh, about 14,000 ships per year carrying substances or, or goods that we consider dangerous for the environment uh, sails uh, through our coast, okay? So to be prepared uh, to respond to an accident in our coast is essential for us. Um, for Unfortunately, we have a vast experience in, in accidents the, since 1970, uh, several accidents have happened, uh, have, uh, have happened in our coast. Uh, some of them will be forever engraved in our collective memories, like, uh, like for instance, uh, the accident of Poly Commander, Urquiola, and in 2002, uh, the Prestige. I don't know if you have heard about that accident. It was terrible for us, terrible for our economy for our environment. <clears throat> so as consequence of that, of that the, the regional government of Galicia uh, had decided to create, a, elaborate a, a contingency plan for our coast. Uh, the institution I represent, the INTECMA, is in charge of uh, create all the cartography needed to manage a, a crisis. And after that, we have to transfer all this information to the Galician Coast Guards in order to help them to, to carry out the best decisions to, to act in, in consequence, you know? <clears throat> but what happened if, as in the case of the prestige, the resources we have are not enough for fight this spill? We have the Spanish government activate the national contingency plan and we have to transfer all the information we have generated in Galicia, uh, we have to transfer this information to the, to the Spanish government, uh, to the Spanish uh, authorities. Here is where I can mention for the first time the, the word interoper interoperability. So we need to ensure that the interoperati uh, interoperability of our data uh, is that, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example. Normally, suddenly, um, oil spill is detected and reported to the uh, authorities, okay? The contingency plan is activated and a lot of information, a lot of technical scientist information is generated. But if we don't have the, the tools um, the appropriate tools to manage all this information and to generate a response with all the actions to be carried out, at the very best, after one hour, this information is not going to, to arrive. Um, we are going to be late to react on time, 
Okay. Uh, why I'm going to what I have told you that because this is a scenario we have to deal with during a pollution event. The response unit has a lot of information, has to manage a lot of information from different sources, from different uh, nature, like models, like satellite Im images, like uh, information about the coastlines, p uh, information that comes from the coast guards, the meteorological office. And we have to manage all of this information in order to generate mm -hmm. uh, um, geographical information, geographical uh, data that has to be disseminated to the different end users, the end users that, that are going to, to that, ha that, has, that have to, to respond to the crisis. Um, besides this, we can't um, disseminate or transfer all this information, all the information generated to everyone, because you have to remember that during a crisis, we don't have time to manage, to deal with uh, information that uh, is going to introduce entropy in our work. So we have to um, choose the information we are going to send to every to the end user according to their, their, their role they have in the, in the, during the crisis. Uh, besides the tool we need has to be robust, quick and accurate and has to be also very easy to incorporate in the structure of the organization. For the organizations, it has to be like plug and play, okay? They don't have to, uh, they, in fact, they don't want to uh, restructurate all this, all the organization in order to incorporate a new tool uh, that they don't know if they're going to use or not. Um, that's why in Galicia, we have established, or we are, working this spill response common operation picture, COP. What is a COP? A COP is a computer system uh, based on or composed by a, a geographical information system uh, technology. And this GIS has to be fed with all this, this kind of information, for instance, information about the protected areas, outputs from models, uh, satellite images, uh, in order to produce a single source of information that uh, is going to help the, the different uh, actors involved in an incident, the decision makers, the emergency managers, to act in consequence. It's what I told you before. We have a lot of information. We have to choose this, the, the information we are going to distribute to an end user in order to help us to, to do their work without any kind of distractions. Uh, we have begun to work in this project in, uh, in, in 2000, not exactly in 2009, a little bit later, but in the, time, in the time framework of these projects, Arcopol, Arcopol Plus, and Arcopol Platform. Uh, in fact, my colleagues have told me that the Acropol platform project has been just awarded on Tuesday under the first Atlantic project awards in the category Atlantic Marine and Coastal Environment. We are very proud of that. And nowadays we are working in this, in this scope uh, under the, the scope of Marine project. And well, after this break for the commercials, uh, I would like to tell you how we are designing, how, how we are developing our COP. Uh, we are specifically working in, at searching information, the information that is going to be needed and very useful uh, during a crisis. Um, but uh, we have uh, find, found this information not only in our SDIs, but in the, in the SDIs, for instance, from the Ministry of Agriculture, Food of, and Environment of Spain, the SDIs of the regional governments, SDIs of other institutions. Uh, we also want that our COP uh, deals with near real-time information, so we have to be able to incorporate this information uh, on the fly 
And as I told you before, it's really, really important for us that to create web viewers customized for the end user. Each, uh, each end user is going to work with uh, the information they really need. For all of that, uh, we are using OGC standards like WMS, WFS, SOS, uh, and in this way, we can guarantee that we are always, yes, if we uh, add that we are working with official SDIs, like the ministry and OGC standards, we can guarantee that we are always working with the last, more official, more updated information. <clears throat> uh, just how Inspire has helped us to, to develop our COP. We think um, that the best for everybody, for us, for the other end users, is to um, create metadata. So we are creating, we are still creating metadata for uh, all the data we have. Um, and not only belonging, the, the metadata belonging of, um, to the 34 inspired things, but for all the information we have, because we think it's a good practice, and we think we, that this practice, all the create metadata, should be extended to all the geographical uh, information. To have uh, catalogs has uh, helped us very, a lot just to discover new geographical information. And we are always working in trying to make our information interoperable because as I've I told you before, uh, we have to ensure that in case that the national authorities need our information, our information has to be used for them, and has to be, uh, they have, have to be able to use our information without any problems and very fast. That's that before a crisis, but during a crisis we have to be able to view this information to download this information and to distribute this information to other systems. Um, we think Inspire is the best tool for that, and we are working in, in transfer all our data to Inspire. It's not an easy, an easy task. Suppose everybody of you have, has this experience, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be hard, and it's going to take our time, but uh, we are going to work in that line. Um, also, in the scope of Mariner project, uh, Mariner is, uh, is, uh, works, um, the, the aim of a Mariner is, is uh, the, to work in the uh, chemical accidents. So we are trying to create um, common schemas, style sheets, and so on, based on OGC, Gmail, and chemical and clean net, clean net format in order to have a common format to share this kind of information of chemical incidents with other institutions. Uh, and well, I would like to show you a web viewer example we have. Uh, as you can see, this is the official, it's like a, well, a test. It's not a test, it's a um, viewer for everybody. An example of the, what, kind, what kind of information we can display. Uh, physical cartography, coastal resources, uh, outputs from models, uh, from models, from different sources, different nature, with time component, with uh, static information, near real time information. And we can display all this information all together in our, in our web viewer. And as, con uh, well, drifters also. And as conclusions, uh, we have uh, designed a COP in order to produce the cartography of, uh, for oil and h and speed crisis. This COP is uh, based on OGC, pro is use, uses OGC protocols and, and try to follow the, the INSPIRE directive. And it has designed using open source. Uh, it helps us to manage the data from different sources and different users 
are going to have access to different information by, based on the, on the profile, the role they are going to play during a crisis. And currently it is being used not only for, uh, is used by the Galician Coast Guards and the technical stakeholders, and not only in training cases, but in real, real cases. Anyway, we are still working for, in that and trying to, to improve the, the behavior, but we are quite uh, satisfied with the, with the results. And we are delighted to, to share with you, all of you, this information, if you think it could be useful. And, and by the way, if you have any contribution to, to make to this project, we were very, very happy to talk with you because uh, the contingency, the, the accidents in the coast are everywhere. Uh, and I think it could be useful for everybody to share this kind of experiences and information. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the floor is open. If you have any questions to the, to the speaker, any comments, perhaps? It's Friday. Yes. So it's not really a question, it's a comment. Actually, I like the example very much because uh, here we see that, uh, well, okay, the main purpose, uh, of course, of Inspire is to support environmental policy, policy cycle, etc. But another purpose of Inspire was to support emergency response. And this is a very good example how here emergency response uh, takes advantage of this uh, unique opportunity. So I'm very glad to see this presentation. So this is, sorry, I cannot give a question, but I can you give this comment? So. Oh, thank you. Uh, as I've said, uh, all the information is, uh, I think you can uh, visit the Arcopol website. There are a lot of information there. And the Mariner, we are still working on that. As I've said, we have just been awarded because it's a, it's a, a project that has uh, well, it's importance here in Europe. Uh, well. So thank you for the comment. Yes, uh, I, I also have a, um, a, a question. Um, actually, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you have use cases for by uh, by uh, technical stakeholders. Yeah. Um, do you have perhaps a concrete example when uh, when there was a, actually a crisis and this uh, yeah, system this, uh, was used, or perhaps uh, this is a second question actually, if um, for impact assessment uh, was was this uh, system used you know, for for assessing impacts, for instance construction or whatever, or in coastal areas, I don't know. It's yeah, uh, first question. In, okay, in Galicia there are always small accidents, you know, more small spills. Um, these, apart from the Galician Coast Guard, the technicians that have to know where the spill is going to go are using this, this tool, you know, just to predict the, for the forecasting. The forecasting is very important for us, just to use how to, to, to be aware where the spill is going and to prevent all the, all the, the, the authorities and so on. So the technicians are using this tool to forecast where the spill is going to, to go. No? And the second question was... Um, for impact assessment, um, is it used, this, uh, this system? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but for, thanks to God, we we didn't have a, we are not having big uh, accidents in our coast nowadays. Fingers crossed. Um, but what we are using this is actually used. But we are trying trying to to improve the, the the tool because we are we know that there are a lot of work to do, and this is inspire is not um, hundred percent uh, uh, there. So what, and besides we have to talk with all the, this is a, because there are not, uh, a lot of authorities that are not aware that the importance of this tool, no? we have to talk a lot with the people, try and uh, teach them to use the, this tool, um, let them know that this is going to be very useful in case that another prestige, another prestige comes. So 
well, there's a lot of work to do no? uh, until uh, yet, but well, I hope that we, mm, not, I hope that uh, this tool uh, has to be never used in a real case, a big case, no? That we, the best no, uh, new for us is that the work that we are going to use this 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 um, tool in small cases and in training exercises. But anyway, um, just one one more question. Yep. Sorry, <laughs> uh, regarding the the gathering of the information, um, you have um, I guess the stakeholders are the ones who who produce the information. Yep. Um, meaning that you have actually bilateral agreements with the authorities, no, this or this is introduced on a voluntary basis? Um, so uh, most of the information are information from the SDI here in, we produce, mm -hmm. we ourselves produce, we have to talk with ourselves, and me the meteorological, meteorological office that belongs to, the, mm -hmm. to the, the regional government. So this kind of um, flow of information is very easy. We don't have to, there is no problem with licenses, with agreements. And it's, um, I think we, in Galicia, we, everybody, we are trying to work in the same line to prevent the accident. So this information is open for, for us. And I think nobody has, you know, all this information is open from, for us and for everybody. If you want to use it, it's, uh, Open license, so open license, no. Mm. It's public information. We have the, it's information generated by the public administration, so it has to be public. It's the, the mentality we, we have in this case, so. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, so, um, so we could see in this uh, presentation. Um, I just uh, saw the, the read the abstract actually that um, this is also funded by by DG um, uh, Echo, so by the Commission for the uh, Civil Protection Mechanism. So the um, the next speaker. The floor is yours. Good morning and welcome you all. I'm Ezgi Sar Musak from Ministry of Environment and Urbanization, Directorate General uh, Geographical Information Systems. I'm an urban planner and GIS expert. Um, we all know the availability of consistent, up-to-date and relevant information is quite essential for rational decision-making processes and a sustainable environment. Now I'm going to present to you what we do within the context of Turkish NSTI and INSPIRE uh, and how we manage and publish our environmental data. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Minister of Environment and Urbanization is responsible for the environment and urban planning in Turkey. Um, the ministry consists of 10 general directorates, uh, but in this presentation I will mention only four of them. Two of them are the producers of environmental data, Director General of Environmental Management, Director General of uh, Environmental Impact Assessment, Permit and Inspectation. These directorates uh, produce spatial and non-spatial data related to environment. Uh, the other Directorate General is Geographical Information System, uh, the DGGIS, I will <laughs> shortly uh, say uh, DGGIS, uh, is constituted to carry out the tasks regarding the building, utilization and development of the spatial data infrastructure in Turkey. Environmental data are managed, transformed and published by the DGGIS within the scope of Turkish NSDI. The last, uh, last general directorate is um, spatial planning. Uh, spatial planning uh, directorate uh, 
develops environmental plans, spatial strategy plans, territorial plans, and integrated coastal zone plans by evaluating and using this environmental data. Shortly after, I will present the samples of data related to environment, but uh, I would like to give a short brief about the legislative framework of Turkey. Um, we all know uh, the inspired directive is obligatory for European uh, Union member countries, uh, regardless of the fact that the inspired directive is not obligatory for our country, uh, but we are making efforts to build our NSTI uh, based on inspired directive. In February 2015, regulation on the establishment and management of national geographical information systems has entered into the force. Minister of Environment and other na national uh, authorities in Turkey are obliged to make existing data sets conform to Turkey's national data uh, infrastructure specifications based on INSPIRE, ISO, and OGC standards. <clears throat> on the left, you can see the main themes uh, of Turkish NSTI teams. Uh, and, uh, on, and on the right, you can see the thematic themes of Turkish NSTI, uh, and these are the uh, themes related to our subject, plant sites and environment production and industrial facilities. Um, in this slide, you can see our published data, like flow monitoring stations, uh, water quality monitor monitoring stations, lake monitoring stations, noise data, etc. Um, these data are related to INSPIRE's environmental monitoring facilities, production and uh, industrial facilities, and human health and safety. And these data, environmental plans, spatial strategy plans, integrated coastal zone management plans, are related to INSPIRE's area management, restriction, regulation zones, and reporting units. Um, some of these data you can see online text here. Uh, are, opt are updated online. Um, these data are updated by the data producer directorates or organization using external uh, applications. But the offline, offline data are delivered to the DGGIS as GDB files, shape files with their MXT files, including layer names, symbol rules, colors, queryable attributes, and attribute analyzes, sometimes in uh, other national formats like Net Netcat. We transform and publish these data. I know, I know you can't read, but uh, this is the conceptual database design of environmental data. Um, I won't give a detailed information about that, but uh, this is a database overview. Uh, but I must say, uh, this database has been prepared in accordance with the rules specified in the Turkish NSTR data spe specification documents. Um, we, when we look at the infrastructure of Atlas and web services and Geoportal, um, we see a multi-tiered architecture here. I must say this is a very, very simplified schema. schema. Um, in the data tier, uh, an enterprise re relational database management system is running. Uh, all spatial and non-spatial data are organized in it. And file geodatabases for other sources like imagery and processed map caches. In the service tier, there are enterprise GIS servers. They are providing an efficient way to share data and publish standard web services like WMS, WFS, WCS, etc., to support remote client workflows. The ministry system includes an integrated mix of software developed to sat satisfy a full range of GIS user requirements. All the components are designed as a system to work together within an integrated enterprise GIS environment. In the presentation tier, ministry's main data sharing applications, Atlas and Geoportal, are running. These applications are serving to Ministry of Environment users, other ministries, municipalities, and all other organizations and institutions and users. Uh, and external applications like online environmental information system 
e-inspectation system, ship-based tracking system, etc. We have a lot of uh, environmental applications running on uh, ministry servers. Um, these applications uh, using our web services. Um, I want to mention uh, about the Atlas applications uh, specifications. Atlas is a web-based JS application. is running on ministry servers for more than three years. And nearly every year, new modules and features are added to the application. Atlas has been developed on a client-server architecture and designed to work with most of the server applications that supports OGC web mapping service standards. More than uh, 500 layers, mostly prepared at the Turkish and STI standards, are updated continuously by the ministry and the data producer organizations. Some layers are delivered to Atlas via standard web services from other ministries, organizations, and municipalities. Our ministry makes web service sharing protocols with them. Atlas provi provides a base mapping functions. Um, I will shortly present. <laughs> Uh, shortly after, I will present the uh, uh, Atlas uh, application. Um, Atlas provides a ba base mapping functions and is open to develop any further mod modules with its open and flexible architecture, uh, etc. <laughs> There's an ad uh, administrator panel behind Atlas application. The Atlas administrator uh, account can manage users and layer authorization for users. All necessary Atlas users and created, uh, are created by the DGGIS depending on their institutional needs. Users can only access the layers authorized for themselves. Uh, uh, I will show now the Atlas application. But if you don't have time, I will uh, present with my video. We'll see. <laughs> I think in internet is a bit too slow. So I will use my video. Uh, this is the Atlas interface. Uh, I, uh, as I am, as I mentioned before, I will use. I will log in with my username. Uh, these layers are customized for me or my organization. Uh, I think you can't read, but administrative units, hydrography, transport networks, address, buildings. These are the Turkish NSTI teams. Uh, now it's showing the environment layers, noise maps, pilot areas, result maps facilities, etc. <laughs> go forward, I will go forward. Uh, you can see the environmental data here, water quality monitoring stations. We can identify query like this, noise maps. environmental plans like this. <laughs> um, and uh, in, a, in accordance with the Turkey's NSTI studies and the tasks of the DGGIS, Turkish National Geographic Data Portal, 
GeoPortal uh, project was completed has been, and has been open to the public. GeoPortal is based on Inspire ISO and OGC standards. GeoPortal application includes discovery service, view service, download service, and transformation service. Uh, but the uh, transformation service only includes the coordinating transformation. Implementation of transformation service, e-commerce, and mobile ver versions are planned. Uh, this is the GeoPortal uh, interface. Um, uh, that's all, <laughs> I think. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the floor is open. Um, any questions from the audience, or comments? I have one, uh, actually two questions. One, uh, one question is, um, um, how open is this uh, regist registry? So uh, do you need, uh, do you need um, uh, registration for it? Or uh, you know, as an ordinary citizen, I can just um, uh, Google it and, uh, and uh, have access to all this information? Uh, you can access Atlas uh, as a user, normal user, uh, but the layers are limited. Uh, if you work uh, in an organization and that organization have a protocol with our ministry, you can uh, access a full range of data, sorry, <laughs> full range of data. Mm -hmm. uh, protocols are important. Uh, just one one more question uh, as regards uh, interoperability. As um, apparently the this um, atlas is is in in Turkish. Um, uh, did you actually consider the uh, cross border aspect so uh, that you can actually exchange information with uh, with uh, neighboring countries, uh, yeah. for instance, in, in Europe? Uh, there is not a, uh, there is not a. Uh, work on it, but uh, maybe in, in the future, I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> so with this, um, I call to the floor uh, our third uh, uh, speaker, Mr. Uh, Simon Shilton from the UK. Uh, good morning. Um, disclaimer before we start, I'm not a GIS person. I'm a, an acoustician who works in strategic noise mapping. So I use a lot of 3D and spatial and statistical data for my models. Um, so the first half of this I'm very comfortable with and the second half of this was written by my co-author who does know a lot more about spatial data than I do. So any difficult questions? Please, I'll refer them to my co-author. Um, we will try and, we have tried to structure it in the context of the main themes of Inspire, so acquisition and integration of data, analysis and publication, and then with a few conclusions re regarding Inspire and the noise directive. So firstly, acquisition and integration of data. Strategic noise models, if you're not familiar with them, uh, are based upon engineering calculation methodologies which try to determine the emission of noise from transportation sources, roads, railways, aircraft, and industry, and how that noise propagates from the source to the receiver, the receivers being the population exposed to that noise. The 3D pathway, the propagation path, is generally made up in our models using a combination of different data products. So we'll have a source line, which is either a road or a railway in this example, in the vicinity of the source line, we prefer to use 3D brake line data where it's available. It gives us a higher precision in terms of the relative height differential between the source and, and the edges. 
Further away, we tend to use equal height contour data as it's more efficient in our calculation process where the lower quality has less of an impact. We then have building polygon data. Uh, we have to generally manually create bridge elements to support the sources over the ground. Um, we put in noise barriers and things like that as well as ground cover. We typically work at one to a thousand scale, maybe one to 2,500 scale in certain cases. Um, and the coverage can be quite extensive. I worked in Malta in round one and round two, which is about 230 square kilometers. But both of us also worked in England in round two, which is an 87,000 kilometer coverage at one to a thousand scale. It's quite a significant undertaking. The big key difference for the noise modeling compared to traditional GIS is that we actually flip the model through 90 degrees. The noise calculation software interrogates the data in the vertical plane, not in a horizontal plan view. And what we're looking for is edges. We're looking for the propagation, the diffraction edges in the propagation path between the source and the receiver. So we're interrogating the data in a way which is not that familiar to a lot of GIS people. And we have to spend a reasonable amount of time sort of getting them to used to working in 3D and thinking in 3D. Um, but it can be very successful. The calculations are generally undertaken by specialist software because it's quite a heavy calculation load. We work on a 10 meter calculation grid, so we've got 10,000 points, receptor points per square kilometer, as well as building facades where we have receptors five meters around every facade of the building. So we can end up with 20, 25,000 calculation points per square kilometer, and each of those could take into consideration tens of thousands of individual source receptor paths. Um, so this tends to be handled by specialist noise software, which is external to the GIS, but often linked in some way. Um, in terms of other the thematic areas, we also need metrology because uh, wind direction and speed and temperature gradients can affect the propagation of sound, and the better models include uh, that change in the, the noise propagation. So this is a summary of probably about 50% of the types of data input that we need. And as you can see, it's quite extensive. Some of it's spatial, some of it's statistical, some of it's population, some of it's building use. So we have a variety of information. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years, so I was doing this before Inspire turned up, um, and I'm hoping to continue doing it in the future. So we've got a view idea about how Inspire can help us. But by and large, noise is a secondary user of data, which means that none of the data has been prepared for us, none of it is owned by us, and none of it is managed in the way that we would like it to be. Um, we use multiple spatial data sets and statistical ones, and we need to integrate them to bring them together and collate them and connect them in ways that haven't necessarily been thought of before by the original data owners. So we have challenges with multiple owners, multiple resolutions, multiple licenses, and various currencies. Um, Inspire has definitely delivered us benefits. I've seen that over the past 15 years. But there do remain challenges for us going forward. Um, data owners need to understand our requirements a little bit more. We can hopefully get access to that via the Inspire technical documentation. Uh, but we don't help ourselves. There's a lack of standardization within the noise domain anyway. Each of the software uses a different data format. There's very little collaboration inside of our marketplace. And that means that if, if we try and externalize that to something like Inspire, we don't have a consistent unified message. Um, inconsistent data quality and the five-year cycle for the noise directive work, like the air quality directive work, actually does not help in terms of consistency, because the competence authorities see it as being a one-off event every five years, which means that we end up with rip and replace, or we end up with huge problems with updating data sets on a five-yearly basis, rather than having some kind of ongoing, permanently live system, which can adapt as new data comes through. In terms of analysis, um, well, the directive itself sets out a requirement for what would be seen as a sort of mixed approach to analysis. Some of it is area specific. The agglomerations are urban extents defined by member states. 
So we have an area-based assessment for those. However, we also have to look at major infrastructure, major roads and major railways in between these urban areas. So then we have a source-based assessment, which is kind of a mixed message, really, in terms of how we're supposed to go about it. Um, we've got our next reporting cycle is due at the end of 2017, with the, the next one after that in 2022. In theory, it's a continuous management process, as with the Air Quality Directive and the Water Framework Directive. And it's really all about the noise action plans, uh, which are how noise is being managed in the local environment. And they're supposed to be informed by the strategic noise maps and the public consultation process. In reality, most competent authorities tend to get bogged down in the technology of the strategic noise mapping, and then the action plan becomes a bit of a secondary thought, unfortunately. Um, as I said, we have been doing this for 15, 20 years. We, we do do it quite successfully. This is an element of the English noise map for the road network. We have full national coverage of it, but the question is how do we update it for round three, and then how do we carry it forward into round four? This was done as a one-off project with no real sort of uh, ongoing sort of updatability designed into it, unfortunately. So I'm bound to say this is quite complicated. We end up working in multiple geographies with multiple sources, multiple noise indicators. We don't just create one noise result per grid point because there are different ways of looking at noise in terms of equal energy or different aspects, different times of the day. And we have multiple outputs. And then the analysis is undertaken at various different levels. So we've got localised levels where they're interested in very small areas with very specific hotspots for their noise action plans. There's national coverage, such as the, the national road map or rail map, where national policy decisions are made at strategic levels. But then all of it has to be reported up to the EU and EEA level, where they tend to like to do intercomparison studies between different member states, and they do, tend to like to do sort of rankings and league tables and all of that kind of thing. So it's difficult to know exactly how to design the, the process and how to design the system because we've got such varying degrees uh, of usage of the data and such completely different outputs in terms of what they're trying to achieve from it. Um, at EU level, the pan-EU exposure assessment tends to be undertaken by EEA. They have a five-year reporting cycle that goes into their state of environment report. They like to look at league tables and compare cities with cities and countries with countries. However, my view is that aside from the fact that we all have produced noise grids, there is an extraordinarily uncommon process which each of the cities goes through to develop these noise results. So any intercomparison between, even within member states is questionable in my experience, and between member states is really without validity. It doesn't stop them doing it, but personally I don't think there's any real validity to it. And that risks uh, misinterpretation. This is a screenshot from the uh, EONET uh, noise viewer. All of the data reported in round one and round two into the EEA is available here. Under open data, it can be downloaded, various databases, the statistical results as well as the mapping results can all be accessed and downloaded where they've been supplied by the member states. So coverage is not complete. Um, in terms of publication, the noise directive, the end, states that the information must be made, made available to the public in line with the Our House Convention, so that's perfectly straightforward. And Inspire Annex 3 and Theme 5 and Theme 11 does reference noise, albeit very briefly. So it is in there. There is a hook on which to uh, connect everything with and with which to publish the data. The noise directive doesn't help us because it defines a strategic noise map as either graphical plots, which is maybe what we all expect, but it, they could also be numerical tables of numbers or numerical data in an electronic form. So again, we've got questions about, well, what is it we are going to publish? What are we going to give back? Yeah, and then none of these is actually defined in any standardized way. The closest we've got is the EEA reporting mechanism, but that's non-obligatory and isn't used by all the member states. And then we can also create noise maps or exceedance levels or 
we need to create statistics on numbers of dwellings, numbers of schools, numbers of hospitals, and numbers of people exposed in dwellings, so, which is why we end up at one, one, one to a thousand scale, because we're being asked to do such a very, very high level, you know, numbers of people exposed to the nearest hundred in the city, which is why we end up at one to a thousand scale. So what do we publish? Well, we've got noise levels, but how do we classify them and which indicator do we publish? Do we publish noise abatement zones or important areas or exposure statistics? Do we publish the definition of sources? Do we the difference maps, because we can do before and after scenarios? The results of the measurement surveys, where we've undertaken real measurements rather than calculations. Do we publish the noise action plans? Well, yes, we must publish noise action plans. Or do we publish noise complaints, where we're collecting that information? So again, there's, there's a huge range of different output products which could be and arguably should be published, but again, none of these are standardised between member states, let alone on a pan-European basis. Uh, there's been no real connection between noise and INSPIRE at the moment, so there's not really any thematic area we can connect to. And because there are so many underlying decisions which go into the process of creating the noise level results, this is a a slide which is used in so many noise meetings over the past 10 years, it's unbelievable. This is the results of the round one noise mapping in 2007. It's difficult to imagine that twice as many people are exposed to noise in English cities compared to German cities. This is merely a byproduct of the decisions which have gone into the process. We've all followed the same process, but there are so many underlying decisions which go into it that we can have such an enormous discrepancy in the actual outputs, which makes any intercomparison between these totally invalid, in my view. As an example, London, decisions were made in that mapping project which were probably more similar to Germany, but completely at odds with the rest of the UK. It totally changes the exposure. So, conclusions. Um, strategic noise maps require wide range of data. Inspire without doubt is helping because I've realized in the past 15 years how much data is available we just never knew about it before. So the whole cataloging and publication and access side of things is helping enormously. Um, but we need further engagement between the noise people and the Inspire people so that we can get the decision makers as well as the technical people to actually engage. Um, Analysis of the end noise results takes place at so many different levels that it's difficult to define exactly what our output products should be unless we have such an enormous range of them that it becomes burdensome. So maybe we actually need to try and get some policymakers to decide what it is that we must publish and then we can concentrate on those. Publication is a complex issue because of the range of output items and the way that they are used, set, used by secondary users. We've seen people pick up the noise results and then do uh, MP did, uh, health impact studies. But is it valid for that? Was it ever designed for that? So they're linking uh, myocardial infarctions with the noise levels, but were they ever designed for that? Probably not. And all these issues kind of get interrelated, and as I said before, the five-year cycle doesn't really help us. We need more of an ongoing permanent thing. So. Finally, noise is, in my view, pan-thematic <coughs> in that we need data from so many different subject areas and we output a number of different types of data also. So we don't know who to engage with. Now that Inspire has thematic clusters and they're developing specifications, we're getting to a point where there's a, there's a purpose to us interacting because we can have some influence over the definitions of those specifications. But I look through it and, and I need to be in five thematic clusters. How am, I going to how am I going to work hard enough to be in those five thematic clusters? Um, and then the noise domain is not inspire aware. I mean, only last year we had a new directive published for a new common noise assessment method for Europe, the new calculation method. There isn't one single mention of inspire anywhere in it. It's not even alluded to. And yet this defines, there's a section in here about how to assign people to dwellings on buildings. Now, I'm sure there's an Inspire thematic cluster looking at population. So why weren't we connecting to that? So we don't help ourselves. Um, so there's a lack of standards in noise, and this again is a barrier in terms of how we interact with Inspire. And 
going forward, we're going to need to, if it's going to become more efficient, more consistent, more comparable, and more useful, I think an engagement would be really good. And to a degree, the common method is seen as a huge destabilizer in the noise community. Everybody's looking at round four in 2022 as, as a, almost a reboot for the noise directive with the new calculation method. So arguably, this is a great opportunity for us actually to try and set the thing up on a more rational, more consistent, and more technically robust basis. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, really uh, fascinating uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the, the floor is open uh, for questions, um, comments. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I totally agree with you uh, on the on the pandemic coverage uh, regarding the output um, and the input of noise. One question I had. As, the, as typically the, the noise calculation software produces, gives you as output a 10, 10 meter grid uh, of uh, noise exposure it, it um, do, with yes. the night and with the day values. So why have you ever considered just publishing that uh, in, in using Inspire standards and see what other users would do with that? Because clearly you have some predefined analysis you have to do for reporting the strategic noise maps, this is kind of carved in stone, you have to do that. But uh, what other possibilities can you imagine? Have you ever tried to expose the raw data, the 10 meter grid, uh, to the public and to see what they would do with that? Um, the 10 meter grid data is available from some of the member states under their open data policies. And the five meter contour data sets is available from most of them who've reported to the EA. The EA website, you can download the five meter contour data sets in all, for all member states who've reported. And then several of the member states now publish their grid results under open data, uh, England being one of them. So the, the, the information is being made available. But the question is, I think, you know, it was the purpose of de de developing those 10 meter grids was for strategic noise mapping in line with a specific process for the strategic noise maps. And it doesn't necessarily mean that those noise level results are valid once you get below 60, 55, 60 decibels. But the raw results will have results down to 20 or 30 because that's what the calculation process delivers. And sort of, you know, so there's a huge health warning, so to speak, associated with the data. You know, again, you can package it in the metadata and say, you know, these are only really particularly valid between 60 and 75, and they're only particularly valid within one diffraction edge of the source, and et cetera, et cetera. But when you're looking at, I mean, we, we produced over 90 billion individual results for the English noise mapping in round two. You know, you, you, you can't put a disclaimer on every single output and then expect it to be re respected in some respects. But yes, they are published. You can, get, you can get hold of the data, and that's what I mean. It, you know, there's a lot of um, health impact studies, a lot of people looking at co noise as a co-founder to uh, heart disease, hypertension, stress. They're looking at it in the context of you know, where it was air quality, noise, uh, income rates, crime rates, et cetera. They're doing you know, cross-cutting uh, research in terms of trying to find causal links or non-causal links. Um, so they are being used for quite a wide range of different things, but it's more a case of that um, at the moment we tend, I mean I'm a consultant, so we tend to get commissioned just to deliver results to tick the box for the noise directive, and they're not necessarily thinking about all of these secondary uses. Yes, uh, I'm Carsten Bering from the European Food Safety Authority. I, uh, the question in the more or less the same direction as well, because our future use case might be to a certain extent similar in the sense of as well combining data from different themes, yep. doing some models and some simulations and coming up with, a, with some, some kind of uh, exposure as well. So did you f see any problems in the, let's say, the, um, the Inspire format to publish such a data because they're not physical realities, they're results of models, they're calculations. 
So it goes a little bit in the same direction as yeah, he was asking. It's, it's, it's the same health warning. You know, they, they, they are the result of a modeling process. And whilst the, the new common method sets out a new calculation method in terms of the equations which ought to be used in order to generate the noise levels, as we saw with, the, um, with this map, there are so many decisions before the software calculates the noise level which have an enormous effect on the noise levels which are generated. Um, each member state is, is allowed to define their own agglomeration, the urban extent for the city, and there's no guidance. So different member states can take completely different choices on how to define an urban extent. Some of them just do a political boundary because it's easy but others do a population density process based upon you know, census output areas or very small area studies. So they end up with a completely different shape and size of agglomeration. So you, you change that one factor and it changes, it changes the exposure at low noise levels, it changes the people exposed to low noise levels, it changes the ratio of people per square kilometer across the whole city. There's then a the question of, in this case, this is road traffic, which roads inside the city do you include in your model? And in Germany, they only include reasonably significant roads with more than about 3,000 vehicles per day, which leads to the uh, residential areas having almost no noise exposure because they're away from the major roads. In England, in round one, they put road traffic on every single road in the network inside the city. 1,000 vehicles a day on every single link in the road network. Boom. Now all of the housing areas have got 50, 55 decibels and they're above the reporting threshold and we end up with 95, 96% exposure. That one decision, that one decision, which roads, that's not in the calculation method, that's not a choice of the software, that's not an output from the actual you know, numerical analysis, that is a process design decision. That's a you know, thematic decision. Now, if you were to pick these results up on face value, they all look like grids of noise results, and you would want to do a comparison between you know, health exposure or risk exposure in Germany against England, and you say England has got huge risk exposure and Germany hasn't. But actually, the basis for those numbers is not the same. And there's, and there's almost no way of getting to that underlying information. The first two years that this slide was presented at noise conferences, nobody knew why. And it was only when we sat down with colleagues from, you know, I worked in England, I sat down with colleagues who worked in Germany and in the Netherlands and in other countries, and we started talking about, well, what are the differences? And it all ends up being upstream decisions made by, because it's a modeling process. And until you start nailing down all of those decisions so that everybody has to, everybody defines their agglomeration the same way, everybody models the same roads, there will always be a risk in comparing one country with another country or one city with another city. After the first round, there was a, a study in Sweden. They only had three cities modeled. Three different cities, three different uh, companies with three different municipalities. They made such completely different decisions that the national authority said there is no point trying to compare these three cities because the basis is so completely different. And that, none of that came down to not following the rules not following the, the directive or not using the software in the correct way. It all came to upstream policy decisions about what to include, what not to include, how to define the city boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a wider issue rather than just the, here's the rule set. And I guess it's that same flexibility. You know, that Inspire includes an enormous amount of flexibility so that the method and the approach and the, the, the specifications can be tailored to the specific situation within one country or one project or one set of data. And noise is the same, but the, the, the risk associated with that flexibility is that it leads to divergency. And therefore, the end result isn't necessarily you know, equivalent in each case. So the comparability tends to be the thing that suffers, even though on the face they all look like noise results. They aren't necessarily directly comparable unless you understand a little bit more about the process which has led to their generation. Very short question. Um, the data set is enormously valuable and you just uh, stated uh, the multiple use uh, we have from that. Uh, just a question for your own opinion. Would we have uh, such a data set or a comparable data set 
without the END legislation? No. No. Without the END, the, the, prior to the END, the Germans were doing noise mapping in cities under a federal law, but nobody else in Europe was. So no. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Peter. I'm Hugo de Groot from DG Environment. Uh, I have a question and a statement. What statement? On the one hand, we are here discussing about content, and the other part is process, yeah. the way we describe it now. And the issue on emissions in general, which applies here for the noise directive, the lack of comparability due to methods and modeling, etc., or policy decisions made, yeah. also applies to the EPRTR register. All, yeah. Also there we find disclaimer that things are not comparable. And from a policy perspective, from a governance perspective even, uh, this is indeed a problem. Now the noise directive was one where we know all the, the annexes to the noise directive, which was underpinned by uh, a number of uh, scientific projects at the time. Yeah. You were probably involved there. So it's one of our most developed instruments to try to arrive at something which is indeed comparable. Mm. And yet we seem to fail. That's on the content, this is just uh, a comment. Now with relation to inspire and inspire not being into, for example, the last uh, amendment uh, to the annex, uh, this is, it was an issue and we discussed it also internally, yeah, the, the common method for noise. Yeah. And my colleague said, first of all, it was extremely difficult to get an agreement in the committee on the uh, new common method. And they did not want to complicate at that moment and jeopardize I the, believe that. The, the negotiations yeah. uh, which were going on by adding yet another factor into it. Although when we designed Inspire at the time, the main reason was the entire risk-based environmental policy approach that we find back in the flood directive, in EPRTR. Yeah. Etc. But that was more a statement. My question to you is now, uh, when I was looking what was going on in Malta and also on all the other noise uh, maps, for the people that are producing this, and not just for the noise maps, but also for more dynamically starting to inform people about the, the, the risks, the exposures that they are um, <coughs> being exposed to, ob obviously. Um, how do you think that Inspire would make the calculation, so the process, more efficient through its services by bringing all the other data that you need on buildings, roads, population, etc., more easily accessible and usable for these calculations? It's, uh, it's twofold. I would say typically 75, 70, 75 percent of the time, the labor, the expense, and the effort involved in making the noise maps is getting to the point prior to starting the calculations. It's about finding the data, connecting the data, collating it, um, bringing it all together. I mean, a road center line, because we model emissions from road traffic, a road center line you know, is from a national mapping agency, typically. But then we need a road surface data set, which might come from the highways authority. We need traffic flow. We need traffic direction. We need gradients. We need numbers of light vehicles, numbers of medium heavy, numbers of heavy vehicles. So we end up getting a whole bunch of different monitoring systems and connecting them together. And often um, geocoding those in a way which has never been done before. So the way that Inspire will help us going forward, the way that we've already seen it help us in the past, is that we become aware that these data sets even exist. You know, 15 years ago when I was doing noise modeling, it was almost impossible to discover if a data set existed. Now we, we know if a data set exists inside a public organization. The next step is once Inspire technical specifications really take root, um, is to get those into some of those source data sets so that we can build one connection once. We can design our connectivity, interconnectivity of all these disparate data sets and we can design it once and it stays like that because the specifications don't move around arbitrarily. But what we're finding is our five-year repeat cycle is we go back to get pavement information and they say, oh, we've changed our pavement database in five years. It's wonderful now. 
but that means that all of our cross-linkages, all of our geocoding from the previous round has now gone, and we start the process all over again. So that, that for me, is the, where Inspire can make enormous inroads into what we're doing. But obviously, we need to engage with Inspire to make sure that the way that those specifications develop actually suit our needs, actually help us make those connections and help us simplify the process. In terms of output products, I'm less concerned. In the end, whatever we're told to publish, we, you know, we generate a lot of different outputs and the policymakers and the public will tell us what's relevant and the researchers will say what's important. And because they're in, inside of our control, if there's an Inspire specification regarding those outputs, then we can include it. But actually our biggest challenge is definitely bringing the information together and connecting it together. Um, I mean, I, did a big project in Turkey for two years, so it's, it's kind of interesting that my presentation is between two Turkish presentations. But what's fascinating there is that at, at a national level, inside the ministries, there's a huge understanding of Inspire, the connectivity of databases, live WMS feeds between ministries, huge access to information. But you go one tier below that, and you go to the, some of the municipalities, and it disappears. There's no real understanding of, of Inspire. There's, they don't even know what databases they've got inside their own organization. And I found that in other member states that I've worked in. At, at ministerial level, at, at, at sort of government level, Inspire's really taken hold and it's really engaged people and systems are really developing in the right way. But then you go, you drop down one level to municipalities who might have some of the very detailed information that we must have for our models. And you can go meeting after meeting after meeting. No, we don't have it. No, we don't have it. No, we don't have it. And you end up with the 10th meeting in the same organization with one different person in the room. And they go, oh, yeah, we've got that. But they've got no catalog. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, sorry, I, a time yeah, constraint. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will need to. Uh, and as you actually mentioned Turkey, so it's actually an excellent introduction yes. for our next speaker. So uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you once again much. for this very uh, informative info. Um, Presentation. So uh, the f um, I invite our next speaker. <coughs> and while he comes, uh, actually, just to, um, and he establishes the, the, the presentation, just to, to highlight that we had a number of, uh, of um, uh, member state commission bilaterals on the implementation and the way forward for uh, closing implementation gaps in the inspired domain. And actually, one of the ideas uh, uh, was to, to link. Uh, Inspire to, to reporting, and this process is actually ongoing, as you could hear uh, if you, you, you could attend uh, previous presentations, previous sessions on, on reporting. So actually, uh, and uh, as the uh, noise reporting is coming up in 2017, uh, so noise is also on the map, and of course it's subject to uh, consultations with stakeholders, MIGP, MIGT, uh, EEA in particular, particular, GRC, but it's on the map, so there's hope. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, handle this challenge, yeah. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, I'm Arif. Uh, in my presentation, uh, I will try to summarize our study. Uh, uh, especially in this study, we are trying to determine disaster risk model as a, uh, by designing interoperable in, uh, national data model as an extension of inspired data teams. <clears throat> Quickly, I will try to summarize what is the disaster and risk concept, and then I will give you a short information about Turkey National GIS specification. A, we can accept this as an extended version of Inspire, depending on Turkish needs. And then, uh, after we use this base, how we try to design disaster risk model. Normally, Turkey National GIS specification is a national model, it's a legal model. But disaster risk model is our research in university. Uh, we try to understand, we try to test how we use this model in disaster risk ap applications with interoperable way. And then with case study, I will try to complete my presentation. Uh, yes, you know, uh, people encounter with disaster, different kinds of disasters, depending on geography, depending on human effect. Each country encounter with different kinds of natural hazards, especially in Turkey. Uh, for example, landslide, earthquake, fire, flood, and uh, traffic accident, uh, 
result in uh, economic and life losses. Uh, normally, of course, with disaster management, we are trying to minimize and elim eliminate destruction caused by the disaster. As you know, GIS is a good tool, it's a successful tool to manage the disaster for disaster management process. Summary, we can tell our approach is disaster management is a complex procedure. Uh, it's a, to manage the different disaster in a common way. We have this approach, yes, uh, like disaster types to manage disaster unit activities. And activities can be a different level as a cycle. And it starts with mitigation phase. It starts with the, the, uh, calculate disaster risk and then you can pass other phases. And to manage the disaster, you need activity. Activity has some task. For each task you have, you need to use geographic data. Maybe this is real-time data, this is thematic, uh, topographic data. This is the general view. If we talk about hazards and vulnerability, normally if you look at the Inspire Nature Risk Model also, yes, hazards is an event causing losses. If I explain vulnerability, it makes society susceptible to effect of catastrophic event, even. If you look at the picture uh, summarily, yes, in the real world, here, I can use this, the real world, maybe after uh, determine hazardous area, normally, uh, uh, sorry. If you have vulnerable elements in this area, maybe this is uh, vulnerable to uh, disaster, this, is the, this can be defined as a risk area. In this way, maybe inter basically intersection of uh, hazard and vulnerability equal to risk area. But interaction between hazard and vulnerability uh, to determine this detail this is really difficult in view of uh, integrated disaster management. In reality, yes, for multiple risk assessment is a complex process. Maybe first you should define hazard resource, and then you should define single and multiple hazard. Maybe one hazard uh, trigger other hazard. Maybe with different way, with different method, depending on the disaster type. With together with vulnerable element, you can determine risk also multi-risk in this way. It's a research topic in detail. Uh, normally, after give uh, some information about uh, general concept, hazard and risk, and then I can tell you, I can explain you uh, our national specification. Also, as a contribution to your quest, you ask about, uh, you ask our colleagues about, is there any interoperability between Turkish standard and other standard? Normally, you know, this is the inspired methodology to uh, design data model. But some I can tell, we have the same approach. We use ISO standard. Uh, we use the same uh, conceptual data model component. But depending on Turkish GIS needs, we determine our data model as an extended version of Inspire. Uh, you can imagine this. In this way, yes, we tell at least our data model includes Inspire base uh, or compulsory uh, contents or uh, feature types and plus includes uh, needs of 254 application analysis. In this way, yes, this, this is like approach of Netherlands, but we can tell, yes, national GIS is a main model. It's based on ISO OGC and Inspire standards. Yes, this is the base model, includes maybe 20 teams, but as a sector model, as an extension of this, you can produce your own model. If you uh, produce something with the same conceptual approach, it, you, uh, we can imagine, we can suppose that it can be interoperable. Yes, our base teams and uh, thematic teams, also our colleagues explain about it. Uh, most of them are designers, some of them at application level, some of them uh, maybe we try to develop, uh, tr we try to determine data uh, production approach, and then maybe next time in national program, we try to, uh, in Turkey, public institution, we produce these data sets. But I can, I'm trying to explain our approach. Normally, yes, 
Our model is Turkish, but with its background is the same with uh, Inspire Techniques. But, uh, you know, uh, if you want to harmonize the data, if you want to combine data, yeah, you need to uh, transform data with ETL tool. But we suppose that because uh, Turkey National GIS model is an extended version of Inspire, in this way, if you convert the data coming from different sources to Turkish National GIS model, easily to convert this data to Inspire specification. Also, we have case study about it. Also, we discussed with some colleagues. But somewhere I can tell how we extend. Yes, this is the address model interoperable with other uh, data teams in Turkey. But if you look at the general schema or component, it's like Inspire address team. For example, if you look at here, this is the building model. Of course, building model is in, is in detail in Turkey. Depending on local government needs, we have more attributes, more values, or some code list, something else. In this way, yes, if, if you look at the Inspire extension approach in, uh, com, uh, in documents, Inspire document, it has some methodology, but maybe the result the same, but method is different. Maybe we determine something as a not, not as, a, as a subtype, maybe we combine something in this same feature in this way. Uh, depending on our needs, we define futures and relationship, but uh, extension approach is the more different from Inspire. Uh, quickly after I pass this one, normally at the beginning I talk about risk model. Yes, risk, uh, all disaster types has different needs. Yes, we focus on five uh, most and most disaster in Turkey. Firstly, uh, depending on academic literature and user needs or uh, needs of models, we determine data requirements and then for each disaster type, type for hazard and vulnerability, uh, after collecting data uh, needs, design UML application schemas and GML application schemas uh, as a, for, the, for data encoding. This is the same technical with also uh, while producing uh, a national model, uh, also we use the same thing in this way, uh, based on ISO standard, based on Inspire standard, as an extension of national GIS, maybe disaster risk model, like model of the model of the model, maybe in reality, but uh, maybe you can understand from the picture. Yes, we have national model, we tell this is the extension of uh, Inspire, but, for example, any disaster types, you need some future types. Maybe this if a national model includes this future type, maybe don't include. Depending on needs, if your needs uh, not uh, included in, the, in this national model, we add this uh, our sectoral disaster risk model. But with interoperable way, it's. Uh, uh, it's link each other in this way. If you develop any risk model and uh, hazard model or vulnerability <coughs> model, directly you can reach this data, can use uh, conceptually in this way. For example, also, maybe you know this uh, picture from Inspire Natural Hazard. Yes, yes, fluid hazard. And this has fluid risk is a combination or maybe interaction of hazards and vulnerability. It's uh, as it, fluid risk is a, a combination of, uh, uh, of fluid hazard and vulnerability. Also, we can imagine this uh, as a subtype of uh, future types in natural hazard of Inspire. In this way, this is the, an example. For example, this shows, for example, earthquake hazard analysis. Yeah, yes to uh, calculate earthquake hazard analysis, you need slope from national topography team, lithology, groundwater, and other uh, features from other teams. In this way, we model uh, the data to provide interoperability to, de to uh, calculate landslide hazard. For example, here we show landslide vulnerability analysis it requires, for example, infrastructure, building data from building data team, transportation from uh, transportation team. Yes, this future class, not inspired class, but maybe 
if this is, uh, we suppose this is extended or uh, uh, also compatible to inspire in this way, we tell uh, this can be uh, extended version of inspire. Quickly, I am trying to pass. Also, depending on the nature of disaster risk concept, for example, here, if you want to uh, calculate or determine a vulnerable building feature type, at the same time, you need to uh, define a vulnerable building for a fire, vulnerable building for transportation, vulnerable building for landslide. In this way, uh, we try to uh, explain uh, all disaster risk con uh, concept and all required data in the model and as an extension or interoperable version of other model. For example, if you see here, basically, yes, maybe you have analysis method to calculate something, but for example, for uh, fluid uh, hazard, you need topography, slope, aspect, and land use, soil, meteorologic data, feature types in different data teams. One minute. Okay. <laughs> and fluid vulnerability, F to calculate fluid vulnerability, you uh, collect the data from building, infrastructure, transportation, vulnerable element. As a combination of this, you can uh, calculate and define fluid risk depending on your analysis model. This is the case study, because we have one minute, quickly I will try to complete. Normally, yes, this is the open model, as we suppose that it is compatible with inspired teams and national GIS data specification. Depending on your analysis tools, you can use free or open source uh, GIS software or function uh, tools, and then Yes, uh, converting data is a challenging process, but we define this data as it, it is an input to the analysis model, model, model where we produce and we produce landslide hazard map. For example, fluid vulnerability analysis model. This the shows our analytic process uh, detail and an example. This, the, this shows open software tools uh, directly use this input data. As a result, we calculate, for example, Lancet vulnerable analysis model. Yes, in detail, especially I focus on data approach. In summary, uh, with open data, we use open analysis tool uh, to define hazard, vulnerability, and risk, as risk a, risk, a, risk a complex process. Maybe as a methodology, multi-risk is a different, uh, a challenging process, but at least we suppose that uh, our model includes data content required for the risk model, but analysis model, depending on researcher, can be changed. As a completion, uh, yeah, in this model, we focus on common scene uh, disaster in Turkey. This aim to cope with disaster risk management and coordination. Yes, open data model. With open data model approach, we determine data contents required in the assessment of hazard and vulnerabilities. Yes, independent from any software and hardware. Yes, like Inspire, like National GIS specification, this object-oriented model. We suppose that this is an extended version of Inspire. The relations can be complicated between hazard and vulnerability to determine disaster risk. We continue to do this research. Uh, but in reality, I have not explained in detail. Normally also, some, for some basic data set, it is, it, you can use this uh, data set as input data. But in reality, 
uh, after I listen other uh, uh, other uh, sessions in in this in this conference, yes, data harmonization is a challenging process. In this way, for example, we use QGIS to handle a G, uh, GML data set. It is easy, you know, but it joins manually, no index, slow for large files. It's a problem, but especially when we use database conversion and to service the data on the web, uh, if we convert GML in a database and to use by uh, QGIS, yes, data indexing and search advantage is beneficial. In this way, this is another topic, but it is the challenging process in our application. Now, this, I can tell as a general vision, as Turkey, uh, as a vision, uh, has uh, tried to uh, develop, design some specification depending on inspired background. Uh, this is the research project. This we only try to show. Uh, also, we are try to uh, uh, try to uh, calculate disaster risk model, and we test the model, uh, our model, how we use this model in the hazard and risk analysis. Besides this, uh, nowadays also I want to an announce uh, there are national projects also in Turkey. There are some capacity building projects, inspired capacity building projects. Maybe uh, we talk about some national things and national model and extension process. Also, uh, now in Turkey, uh, with inspired capacity building project, uh, at local level, we try to adapt municipalities to do this model. Also, we try to uh, convert their model uh, to main model that can be extended version of Inspire. In this way, uh, Turkey is you know, a big country. Maybe there are complex issues, but we try to adapt ourselves to this international approach. In this way, I said at the end of uh, this session, without taking much time, I try to summarize our study. Thanks for your interest. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so any questions from the audience? Then um, I would like to once again thank uh, you. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you for, for all the, the speakers, for the excellent presentations. I think uh, we can give them one more uh, round of applause. Thank you. And just two, two concluding remarks. What I can see actually uh, based on these uh, presentations, a kind of a spillover effect of, uh, of Inspire. We could see in the Mariner project that um, actually they are doing more than what is required strictly by the Inspire Directive, extending over the, the strict metadata requirements of the 34 data teams. You can see that there is progress also in, in Turkey. So in, the, in terms of geogra geographical coverage, there is also a kind of a spillover of Inspire. And just to highlight that uh, most of these projects are actually fund, funded by, by EU funds. So I saw that the Mariner project is, uh, the uh, Turkey received also, uh, as I understand, uh, EU funds also for implementation of the Inspire. And uh, just to highlight that under the uh, Life Plus program, we have a specific information and governance uh, funding opportunity, which uh, provides possibilities for stakeholders, meaning member states authorities, NGOs, organizations, even private entities to request funding for setting up an infrastructure for active dissemination of information underpinned by Inspire uh, models, Inspire solutions. So uh, with that, um, um, we can close this session. Thank you for your attention once again. <laughs>
Kosovo oraya gitmek zorunda mıyız? Yazdım, yaz, yaz, birisiyle geçen yazmana gerek yok. Tamam. 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 Tamam.